Hello, I'm Robert McMullen. I'm a psychiatrist. I have been practicing well over 30 years, mainly psychopharmacology and also TMS, which is uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation, which is are these giant magnets that either stimulate or inhibit parts of the brain uh, to help out with various disorders. I went to Georgetown Medical School, a wonderful place, and, uh, and I did uh, psychiatry at Columbia Presbyterian, which was also nice. Now, I wanted to talk about pregnancy and considerations about taking medication for psychiatric disorders like depression. Uh, there's a lot of concern about these things, and I'd like to just impart a little bit of information. Now, one thing is that the quality of your nutrition actually affects uh, risk for depression. You can reduce your risk for depression by eating more whole foods and fewer processed foods. Now, processed foods are most of these white things like sugar, white potatoes, pasta, bread, rice. All those five things increase inflammation in the body. That may be part of the reason they increase depression. But in any case, if you eat more whole foods and uh, go on something that's more like a vegan diet or like Bill Clinton does a pescatarian diet where you eat vegetables, fruit, nuts, salads, and uh, fish, but eat as little of regular carbohydrates and uh, of steak and chicken as possible. That has been shown to help with depression. It's also sometimes called a Mediterranean diet where fish, salads, and so on. Um, now another problem is, is we have an excess of omega-6s, which are corn oil and other oils like this, and we're not taking in as much omega-3s, which used to be more of our diet. And omega-3s are mainly obtained from fish. And in the past, probably a lot of our omega-3s came from eating the bone marrow of animals and uh, especially eating the brain. So 100 years ago, if you killed a cow or some other animal to eat, you ate the brain. Nowadays, we give it to the dogs. And, uh, but the brain is just full of the same omega-6s that, that uh, we need, except the cow can make them themselves. And we have to eat them somehow. And uh, taking three to six fish oil pills per day is generally helpful for depression. These are one gram pills. And there's some now that are half a gram that are just pure EPA. The uh, EPA is, is icosapentaenoic acid, but just remember it by EPA, like Environmental Protection Agency. And uh, the first patient I ever put on it, I used 18 pills per day, and he's still on that. And if he goes below it, he gets depressed. And the original study in 1999 used uh, pretty high doses, so you can go very high. It's just a food. And if you take three or four fish oil pills, it's like eating a small salmon steak. It's just the fat from it. How many milligrams need to be the EPA? Uh, they say the EPA should be about 2,000 milligrams or so, but I think that the higher, in my, in my experience, the higher the dose, the better. And... Uh, I don't have many people taking as high a dose as he is, but some people that are not responding at a few pills per day, if they'll go to 10 or 12, they'll start to have a benefit. And, and the benefit, we're not sure why it occurs. 40% uh, of, the, of the walls of neurons, of the cells in the brain, are made of this omega-3 if the body can obtain enough of it. Otherwise, it just uses omega-6s. It's like different bricks for the same thing. And they, the neurons function better with the omega-3s. 
but uh, it may also be because the omega-3s decrease inflammation in the body, which is probably a large reason why they reduce heart attacks so much. But in any case, I would eat a lot more of them and a lot less of the omega-6s. Now, there's a lot of risk during pregnancy. You know, the maternal health matters, uh, age matters, the, the younger one is, the less risk. Lifestyle matters, people who exercise a lot and avoid uh, recreational substances are going to have less complications. Now, patients often worry about the medicines, and some of our medicines, like Depakote, are highly risky, and, and we hardly ever give them to someone who's uh, of uh, reproductive age, unless we're sure they would get an abortion if they got pregnant. But many of the others have low risk. One that patients frequently worry about are the SSRIs, like Prozac, Lexapro, Zoloft, and so on, because there are reports and actually significant evidence that taking these medications raises the risk of persistent pulmonary hypertension in the newborns, PPHN for short. And, uh, and that means that uh, they have high blood pressure in their lungs when they're born. This is true. It raises the risk. However, uh, babies with not exposed to any medicine, not exposed to SSRIs, 20 per 10,000 have this problem. If somebody's on an SSRI, then uh, it's maybe 30% more. So then there's 26 per 10,000. So it's so rare in the first place that having going from 20 per 10,000 to 26 per 10,000 is hardly a risk. Now, um, another thing that's very important is cigarettes. If somebody is smoking cigarettes when they get pregnant, they must stop immediately. There's no tapering, no nicotine patch, nothing. You must stop. Nicotine during pregnancy causes attention deficit disorder in the children, and it's quite significant. And it can also make them just have more conduct problems. So as much torture as it is, you got to stop it right away. And, you know, if you have to, just get some Valium or Clonazepam and uh, keep yourself asleep or half asleep for the first few days or a week if you're in complete torture. Another thing that's very important is folic acid. Since we put a little bit of folic acid in grains and uh, breads, uh, the amount of neural tube defects has gone down a lot. Neural tube defects is where the infant is born uh, with spina bifida. The spinal cord is open in the back or is born without a brain called anencephaly and they die in a few days. And these are relatively common uh, malformations. The risk is about 1.2 per thousand live births. And, uh, and if, uh, if uh, you take uh, folic acid, you get a little bit of a reduction. However, if you have an MTHFR gene, that's a little anomalous or slightly abnormal, uh, then that raises your risk a lot. And it's, um, you could tell your doctor it's a folic acid gene and he'll probably know what it is. And if you have the, the worst gene, which is C677T, and you have two copies of it, then, uh, Instead of having a risk of spina bifida of 1.2 per thousand, you've got a risk of uh, 3.28. It's four times the risk. And uh, if you have some of the other anomalous combinations, then you have double the risk, 2.4 out of 1,000 instead of 1.2. 
So, the risk of neural tube defects is 1.2 out of 1,000 live births. And since we've added folic acid to some of the foods, the incidence has gone down significantly in Canada and the United States. Now, there is a, another problem. At least one out of five, maybe one out of four women have an anomalous MTHFR gene. It sounds like an abbreviation for a very bad word, but it's uh, methylene tetrahydrofolate reductase. And there's two of these genes that are, quote, bad, and that means that they can't convert folic acid into the uh, real, actual, active folate vitamin, which has unfortunately got a long name as well, is called L-methylfolate. But it's, it's the active folate vitamin. Now, if one has these abnormal genes, if you have the two worst ones, then, uh, then the, the risk is uh, three times as much. It's about four out of a, out of a thousand burst rather than 1.2. And if you just have other combinations of these anomalous genes, you still have double the risk of this. People who have this gene should not be taking folic acid. They should be taking the actual real folate vitamin, which is called L-methylfolate, and which is easily available in uh, pharmacies, health food stores, and on the internet. And the dose is probably two or three milligrams a day. For depression, we use 15 milligrams once a day, but that's probably way over what you need to avoid birth defects. And the risk of this is much higher than the risk of a medicine causing, like a Prozac or Zoloft causing a negative outcome. Uh, another, another thing you have to think about medicines is that if you're not on medicines, then that causes problems too. Because if the woman's very depressed, then her cortisol levels go up, and that causes vasoconstriction and less blood flow in the baby's brain, and that could cause cognitive problems. And also, steroid hormones affect everything. So, uh, you're affecting all kinds of cells, whereas with an antidepressant, you're just going into a certain cell and a certain receptor, so it's like just going to a keyhole rather than uh, flooding the whole body with some sort of effect. And the other thing is, if, if you don't treat whatever the disorder is, or you cut down the medicines way too low, your illness may become much worse and much harder to treat, and then you can't raise the child very well. Now, uh, the uh, negative behaviors during pregnancy, you know, abusing recreational substances, not exercising enough, being overweight, all these increase uh, premature births and, and uh, gestational diabetes. And, uh, and all substances of abuse should be avoided. Now, some women are just going to have to stay on medicine most of the pregnancy, and a lot of times I will let them try really going low on the medication the first three months because that's when uh, medicines or other things can cause birth defects. After three months, you can take things that do cause uh, birth defects pretty safely. The, uh, and by the way, with the uh, L-methylfolate, this folate vitamin, it frequently helps depression. So uh, that's another reason to get on it, especially if you have this anomalous gene. And 30% of adults are obese, and this is a major problem that everybody should be working on. And there's a couple of different uh, medications that can help that... I believe they're safe and they are safe in pregnancy, uh, metformin and myoinositol, and they can help reduce the uh, weight. 
So there are quite a few considerations in pregnancy, and uh, I wish you luck with them and think about them carefully, but uh, stopping medication is not always the best thing. Oh, and by the way, if you're on something like Zoloft or Prozac, the babies really don't have that much withdrawal from those, especially Prozac. It takes a long time to get out. And, and if you're worried about withdrawal with something, then in the last week or two, you try to reduce that medication as much as possible. But find out from the doctors if these certain agents really do cause much withdrawal. But it's nothing like the withdrawal from heroin and things like that. What about TMS? TMS? Uh, using, oh, using TMS in pregnancy. Gosh, I forgot all about that. <laughs> the... Uh, it's amazing how I don't think about it when I own four of those machines. Um, TMS, transcranial magnetic stimulation, is amazingly good for depression. And it frequently puts people in remission for years. And uh, there's nothing like it. But during those years, they usually need to stay on something as maintenance to keep them out of it. Ideally, we use, like to use uh, lamictal, lamotrigine in low doses and, and lithium in low doses. But, it's safe for but for, for, for pregnancy? Pregnancy, it should be completely safe for pregnancy because all you're doing, for example, with the standard machine and the standard treatment that's been done for over 20 years, is you're doing an excitatory treatment here. So the magnetic field is going on and off rapidly and it increases the activity in the left frontal lobe. And for whatever reasons, and there's a few theories, this really helps depression. But the baby isn't being exposed. It's way here and the baby's down here. And uh, with medications, the medications go through the whole body and into the fetus as well. So TMS is greatly underused in pregnancy. People should be using it really frequently, if not getting off their medicine entirely, but allowing them to really reduce their, uh, the amount of medication they take, especially during the first three months. Thank you very much, Doctor. No problem.